Hey guys, I'm back. I have been meaning to talk about Cracker Island since the album first came out. I had always intended to review it here on my channel, and ideally I wanted that review to be ready the week the album came out, and obviously that didn't really happen, but I had figured, you know what, it's fine, I don't need to review the album as soon as it comes out, I can wait a little while, and oh my god, it's been a year! So recently I've been thinking, why not review it anyways, and why not review it right now? I've been meaning to start posting again on YouTube anyways because I took a little break, and oh my god, it's been four months! But you know what? It's fine. It's given me plenty of time to collect my thoughts, kind of let the album sit and marinate in my brain a little bit, because I don't know if you guys have seen my Gorilla's song ranking, but if you did, then you'll probably know that at the time, I didn't think very favorably of Cracker Island, but now that I've had time to kind of sit with it, my opinions have changed a lot. So today I'm going to be reviewing Cracker Island right in time for the one year anniversary, even though it's technically not right in time because I missed that as well. So Cracker Island was released on the 24th of February 2023 after an extremely long and, in my opinion, bizarre album rollout. According to Damon Albarn, the album was done by May of 2022, but it wasn't released until almost a full year later. When's the album out? Well, see, that's the thing, isn't it, these days? If we've finished it in, in May, and it's not out until February. It's ridiculous. And in that time frame, quite literally half of the album had already been released as singles. This album had 10 tracks and 5 singles. The title track, Cracker Island, New Gold, Baby Queen, Skinny Ape, and Silent Running. So by the time February rolled around, I think people just felt like they had already heard most of the album, because they had, and they were just kind of over it. Despite all of this though, the album did get mostly positive reviews, and it actually became their first number one album in the UK since Demon Days all the way back in 2005. I've decided that I'm going to review this album the same way that I've reviewed TV shows in the past on my channel. I'm going to go through each song on the album, like I would with episodes of a season of TV, and give each one a score out of 10, and then at the end, I'll average all the scores together to get the final score for the album as a whole. Starting with the first track, the title track, Cracker Island. This is the best song on the album by far, which is really frustrating because it just makes me wish that the album was more like this. This song is dark, it's fun, it's upbeat, and to me it just really has an energy that the rest of the album is missing. And speaking of the album as a whole, I do have to say that I love the idea of Cracker Island. I love the commentary on influencer culture and celebrity culture in Hollywood, and I also love the double meaning that it has because Cracker means something very different here in America than it does in the UK. Like, I was flabbergasted when I saw the title of the song and realized that they meant Cracker like Cracker, you know what I mean? But yeah, I love this song. I said in my Gorilla Song ranking video that it was one of the best songs they've ever made, period. And I still do feel that way. This is definitely a top tier Gorilla song, and I'm giving it a 10 out of 10. Track number two, Oil. I didn't have a lot of nice things to say when this song first came out, and unfortunately I think I've liked it less with time. I just think it's really boring and kind of disappointing because I was so excited to hear Stevie Nicks on a Gorilla song, and they just stuck her in the back and auto-tuned her like crazy. There's also an instrumental break in the middle that has these really loud, annoying, artificial sounding drums that genuinely really bothers me. Also, on this song, Damon sings the word doldrums, which always reminds me of Empire Ants, where 2D sings the word doldrums. I don't think it really counts as a callback if you're just using the same word twice, but I thought it was cool regardless. I don't like this song much at all. I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. Track 3, The Tired Influencer. After further review, I have decided that this song is just a worse version of Lonely Press Play off of Damon's solo album, Everyday Robots. I like the lyrics and I like the commentary aspect of it, but really there's nothing remarkable or even memorable about this song. I always just kind of think of it as the one with Siri. 
I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. Track 4, Silent Running. This song really, really, really grew on me. I don't know what it is. I don't know why I thought it was just okay when I first heard it. And I couldn't even tell you why I love it so much now, but I think it's just fantastic. One of the best songs on the album. I'm giving it an 8 out of 10. Track 5, New Gold. This song could have been a 10. It could have so easily been a 10. I already talked about this in my Gorilla song ranking, but because of the guest list on this song, Tame Impala, Booty Brown, I was expecting one of the best Gorilla songs ever. And maybe that's on me. Maybe my expectations were too high because this song is not that. Don't get me wrong, it's good. But I think my biggest issue with it is that some of the lyrics are just so corny, like especially in Booty Brown's verses. I do like the references to other Gorilla songs and collaborators, that's fun. But like some of the things he says, like trending on Twitter is what some of us live for. Like I, I appreciate that he's staying on theme, but like it's just so on the nose and corny. All of this a joke? Polly Shore? That being said, the last minute or so of the song is genuinely really good and I think saves a lot of it for me. Honestly, like, I like this song. I do like this song, I can't lie to you. I don't think it's that bad. I'm gonna give it an 8 out of 10. Track 6, Baby Queen. This is another one that grew on me, although not as much as Silent Running or New Gold did. I think what I'm hung up on is the fact that the lyrics are so grounded in the real world. It doesn't feel like I'm listening to 2D, it feels like I'm listening to Damon tell me a story about something that happened when he was touring with Blur. And maybe that's nitpicky and like kind of dumb to be complaining about, you know, the cartoon of it all, but I don't know. It's just something that bothered me. I think this song would have been much better suited for a Blur record or Damon's solo work. I'm gonna give it a 7 out of 10. Track 7, although it's 4th on the vinyl release, Tarantula. This is my favorite song on the album besides the title track, and I think it's mostly because the vocal performance we get from Damon is so interesting. And yes, it does sound like Damon singing and not 2D. I can't explain to you how I know the difference, but I just do. I can feel it in my bones. But here, Damon is singing a lot more passionately and romantically than we're used to seeing him with gorillas. And I think it's also because the lyrics are very overtly romantic and very sweet. I really like it. And the chorus is super catchy. If you're good for me, then I'm good for you. I just think it's really fun. And this is the song on the album that I find myself listening to the most. Also, I was messing around in GarageBand a while ago, and I quite literally found the sound effects that are used in the opening of the song. Like, I'll show you right now. I'm gonna give this song an 8 out of 10. Track 8, Tormenta. This song has become one of the biggest hits gorillas have ever had, which is kind of insane to me. When I think of the biggest Gorilla songs, I think of songs like Feel Good Inc., Clint Eastwood, Dare, Rhinestone Eyes, songs that are really iconic and have kind of been proven to have a lot of staying power. Like, Feel Good Inc. is still relatively popular almost 20 years after its release, and I don't think we're going to view Tormenta the same way 20 years from now, if that makes sense. I've been seeing a lot of criticism of this song, specifically the fact that it features Bad Bunny, and I'm not really understanding why, to be honest with you. At first I thought it was just gatekeeping, right? I thought that Gorillaz fans didn't really like the idea of Gorillaz working with such a big commercial mainstream artist, but you don't really see those same complaints when Gorillaz have worked with other artists in the past, like Snoop Dogg or Elton John. But I think that has more to do with the fact that Bad Bunny is really popular right now. He's not really as comparable to someone like Elton John. He would be more akin to Drake or The Weeknd. 
But I think what a lot of gorillas fans don't realize, or what they don't want to realize, is that gorillas are pretty mainstream. Like, I heard Silent Running in a Target the other day. If that's not mainstream, I don't know what is. My problem with this song is not the fact that it features Bad Bunny. I actually think that's a good thing that gorillas are being opened up to a bigger audience and a Spanish-speaking audience. I think that's really cool. My problem with this song is that it doesn't sound finished. It's very basic, it's very bare bones, I like the instrumental of it a lot, but it just feels half-baked. I think what this song is really missing is a hook. I think if 2D had a really catchy, really memorable hook in addition to the instrumental, in addition to the verses from Bad Bunny, I think it would be a pretty decent song and it would be deserving of all the hype it's getting right now. But as it is, I'm gonna give it a 7 out of 10. Track 9, Skinny Ape. I feel like this song is kind of better than it should be, if that makes sense. On paper, it looks like kind of a hodgepodge of weird ideas. It's kind of folksy in the beginning, and then towards the end, it breaks down into this kind of ska thing, but I think it works pretty well. And I do like the lyrics on this one. Obviously, I'm a sucker for the cartoony 2D aspect of it. I like when Damon writes from that perspective, but my only complaint would be that it does kind of feel like Damon writing from that perspective rather than 2D writing the song. And again, it sounds nitpicky, it sounds dumb, it sounds like I'm complaining just to complain and also caring about something that doesn't really matter. And I still can't really explain to you how I can tell the difference between that sounds like Damon, that sounds like 2D, but I know it and I feel it and I gotta say it. I'm gonna give this song a 7 out of 10. Track 10, Possession Island. I will say that this song is very pretty but it's one that I don't really find myself listening to that often. Like, it kind of feels too emotional and too significant to listen to just in my day-to-day -day life, but it's also not one of those special songs like Amarillo or Empire Ants that I feel like I have to save for special occasions, you know? It's a lot less ambitious than a lot of other Gorillaz album closers, but I think this is a much less ambitious album than something like Demon Days or Plastic Beach, so it is very fitting. That being said, I am going to give this one a 6 out of 10. So that's it for the standard edition of the album, but I am going to go through the deluxe tracks just so I have an excuse to talk about them again. Starting with Captain Chicken. Listen, if you've seen my Gorilla Song Ranking video, you already know how I feel about Captain Chicken. If you haven't seen that video, basically there was a point in that video where I like, I basically, you know what, you just had to be there. Like, just go watch that video. You'll probably enjoy it and you'll probably end up learning a lot more about me as a person than you wanted to. Point being, I love Captain Chicken. I am not going to apologize for that. I was just saying that I don't listen to Possession Island that often. I listen to Captain Chicken like three times a day, like square meals. I'm eating chicken three square meals every single day. I do have a question though. It does not make sense to me that Dell is featured on this track when in Gorilla's canon, he was spirited away by the Grim Reaper. How does that work? Is he back from whatever afterlife he was taken to? Or are we just supposed to accept that this is somehow the real Dell and not a fictional ghost rapper? No, that can't be right. I'm not even trying to be funny right now. I'm giving the song a 10 out of 10. Bonus track number two, Controlla. This is the first and so far only Gorilla song to be delivered at least partially in Portuguese. I think this is super cool. I love when gorillas do songs in languages other than English, and I'm really, really looking forward to this new album that's being written in India. Hopefully they'll collaborate with some Indian artists. That would be awesome to see. Anyways, I love MC Bin Laden on this track. I had never heard of him before this song came out, but I love his tone and his energy and his delivery and that like little laugh thing that he does, like the oh, oh ha ha, you, you know what I mean? This song's got a catchy hook, the beat's fun. I think the song's great. I'm giving it an 8 out of 10. And bonus track number three, Crocodillas. 
I do just want to start by saying that I think the beat of this song is a little bit repetitive. I do really like it, but it doesn't really change or go anywhere throughout the song and it just kind of feels like the same thing over and over. That being said though, I do really enjoy this song. I like Don Penn's bit and I like the verses from True Goy the Dove. I'm going to give this one an 8 out of 10. And I did want to just take this moment to talk about True Goy the Dove for a second. David Jalakur obviously was a part of De La Soul who collaborated several times with Gorillaz. And without True Goy the Dove, you don't have songs like Feel Good Ink or Super Fast Jellyfish. And I think his loss was a big loss for not only Gorillaz fans, but for fans of De La Soul, fans of hip hop, and for music in general. So I just kind of wanted to section out this part of the video to talk about that and to honor him. So, as promised, now that I've given each song a score out of 10, it's time to average them all together to see what we get for the album as a whole. So, if I've done my math right, for the standard edition of the album, we have a 7.4 out of 10, and for the deluxe edition of the album, with the bonus tracks included, we have a 7.7 .7 out of 10. I think this is pretty fitting, honestly. It's not one of their best, but I don't think it's one of their worst albums either. I think it's just okay, and that is just okay. So this is normally where an album review would end, but because this is Gorillaz, you have the extra little special bonus treat of the accompanying lore, if that's what you want to call it, so I figured I might as well give my two cents on that as well. I don't really know what the general consensus is from the Gorillaz fandom on Phase 7, but I surprisingly really really liked this storyline, although I don't think it really stuck the landing in the end. Let me explain. First of all, the concept of a cult run by Gorillaz is super super cool to me. It feels like a very natural vehicle for all that social commentary on influencers and celebrities because it's like, oh, cult mentality, groupthink. A hive mind, if you will. Comment below if you too are a dig writer. And I also really like the concept of Murdoch as this unhinged crazy cult leader, although I still can't really get a read on him. Like, is he redeemed or not? Are we supposed to be rooting for him? I honestly don't know. And okay, I don't know when else to say this, so I might as well just say it now. The new deluxe album cover that they just released is so much better than the original, I don't understand why they didn't just go with this one. First of all, I love the way it parallels the cover of the Now Now because that was 2D's album, this one's more Murdoch focused, and also the amount of details that are kind of hidden in this painting. The logo of the cult on both the desk and the wallpaper in the background, the portrait of Moonflower, the bottle of essence sitting on the desk. Gorilla's album covers don't usually tie into the story of the phase with this degree of specificity, and I just think it's really neat. I love this album cover. Anyways, I also really like the change in location this phase, how gorillas are out in LA. Again, it provides a lot of cool commentary on Hollywood and life out in the hills. And it also kind of harkens back to phase one when gorillas were living out in LA trying to get their movie off the ground. There's actually a lot of echoes of phase one here, obviously the Hollywood location and also the fact that commentary on celebrity culture is literally why gorillas started in the first place. Another really interesting similarity between phase one and phase seven is the fact that they both kind of have a weird little love triangle back in phase one, although technically it was a little bit before phase one. But anyways, you had that weird little conflict between 2D, Murdoch, and Paula, and now in phase seven, you have that weird little conflict between 2D, Murdoch, and Moonflower. Only this time, the roles are reversed. Murdoch is the one watching the person he likes fall for his bandmate, the bandmate that he doesn't really like. It's, it's really interesting. It's like karma. Again, it's like poetry, so that they rhyme. Although I have to say the idea of Murdoch being actually in love with someone, like having a crush on someone, is still so weird and like out of character to me. He shouldn't be romantic, it's not right, it makes me uncomfortable. I also really like the idea of the podcast to kind of tell the story in these short little clips because you're kind of living through 2D by listening to this podcast. but. 
Oh my god, Kevin Bishop is so annoying. I'm so sorry, but I truly cannot stand the voice that he does for 2D. And once again, Russell and Noodle are given nothing to do. That whole static channel plotline didn't really go anywhere interesting, and just once I'd like to see a phase where they're front and center. Although, back on the positive side, both music videos released this phase were really, really good. I just wish that they were used to tell more of the story, if that makes sense. I know we were supposed to have a video for oil that we didn't get and probably will never get, which is kind of disappointing because from what I heard Stevie Nicks really wanted there to be a video. I thought Moonflower's death was kind of weird and didn't make sense and I also don't like the explanation of 2D being too pure to sacrifice, like phase 2 would like a word. But I listen, I don't want to hate on new gorillas for the sake of it. I know I can be too hard on them sometimes, and I'm trying not to let nostalgia or bitterness cloud my judgment. I think the story was really good this phase, and I honestly cannot wait to see what happens in India. So good, good job, guys. You did a good job this time. But I wish y'all hadn't canceled that tour. So that's it. I hope y'all enjoyed this review of Cracker Island by Gorillaz. I'm sorry that it is so, so late, but I've been meaning to do a lot more standalone reviews here on this channel, and not just of albums either. Although I was thinking about doing one on The Ballad of Darren, I want to review albums, books, TV shows, movies, so just let me know if that's something y'all want to see. But thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, be sure to give it a thumbs up, and if you liked me, be sure to subscribe to my channel. If you want, you can even turn notifications on, so you'll be the first to know when I'm falling in love with my next door neighbor, but she's falling in love with my roommate, slash bandmate, slash friend, slash enemy, slash victim. Anyways, that's gonna be all from me. I gotta go polish my big, thick obelisk. That's not a euphemism. Bye!